something I actually really appreciate because mm -hmm. um, I've been working on this for a little bit and I love reverse engineering and low level computing. So um, normally when I talk about this kind of thing, uh, mm -hmm. people tend to kind of flee. So, um, you know, it's nice that people are actually interested in this uh, kind of all sunling and to hear me talk about it. Um, I'll do a brief introduction to um, my username on here is specified as like a Svetoy Smith, but um, my name is Mark. Um, you might know me as Advanced Persistent Sweat on Twitter um, or uh, Interrupt Vector 80 or just any jumber of jumble of PEX or other usernames. Um, in terms of things that qualify me to speak on this subject, um, I don't really have anything. <laughs> so. I didn't really get any education in it. I don't have any certs in it. Um, my history with it is that I kind of started getting into game hacking as a kid when I was, you know, maybe a teenager. Um, that was probably the first that I started poking around in hex editors, poking around with, um, you know, editing binaries and trying to figure out how they work and crack me's and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so it's been really fun. And um, I hope that I can basically just give people some introductions to a subject that I feel like can be really hard to get into um, until you kind of have some nudges in the right direction. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so what is reverse engineering? At a high level, it's when we're working on something that we want to know how it works and we don't really know how it was made. You know, the design process is typically something along the lines of like you, you gather requirements, right? And then you come up with um, different designs and then you build an implementation and you test it. And so we're doing the reverse where we have, um, we have you know, our, our final output and we're trying to take a peek at it and uh, see what the intention was and what were they going for. Um, so that can also take place in a lot of different uh, methods. So, you know, sometimes you, you may just want to see, hey, can I write like a, a detection for this piece of malware? Or you might want to just um, see, you know, hey, can I figure out exactly what this malware is doing? Or you might have a CTF problem and you just want to see if you can solve it. Or you might have some, um, surely there's some kind of life on a software where you're allowed to try and crack it after a few years. If not, I apologize and I'm wrong. But um, you might have some super old piece of software and like you literally can't go buy a CD key for it. Um, you know, so there's, there's plenty of times when it, it becomes this sort of necessary potentially task. Um, so that said, if we have this binary and we don't have any source code for it, how do we go ahead and start learning? Uh, we can observe the binary as it runs itself. You know, we can run it in a VM. We can run it in a debugger. We can observe, um, you know, so how it's running, so it's behavior essentially. But we can also look at, you know, the the output that we have, like the executable, and that's that's referred to as static analysis. And that's mostly what we'll be focused on today. Um, although dynamic analysis, I'll have a, a little bit of that at the end. Um, so in terms of like, what are we really going for with, with this type of output though? You know, a lot of times, like I said, it can be extracting intelligence. It can be, you know, in the workplace. Um, it can be trying to get, um, you know, say you have some sort of C2 beacon that's calling out somewhere. You might want to know where is that reaching out to? You might want to see um, strings. You can write that Yara rule, like uh, I mentioned writing detection. Um, you might just want to write better malware yourself um, if you're a VXer. Um, in terms of exploit development, it tends to be pretty necessary to do a little bit of reversing to see uh, how what you're trying to attack works. Um, software cracking, DRM removal, that's a pretty common one that uh, is probably where I feel like I've seen it the most in my life is people trying to see, okay, how is this key verified? Is it like a mathematical function? Is it reaching out to a server and uh, verifying it that way? Um, and game hacking, of course, you know, if you want to do things that you're you're not typically allowed to by the game engine itself there's an element of going and seeing how it works via testing to be able to do that so let's talk about some initial concepts that are sort of prerequisite to really getting into this um some of this is going to be remedial for a lot of folks and some of it might be new but so so at a high level we have on our left here this this simple source code right um we're including standard io.h um we have a, a main method and it prints out hello world, and then it returns zero, and it probably ends. Um, so if we compile that, we get something called assembly, typically. Um, really, what it looks like is like this hex on the right, you know, 4D, 5A, et cetera. 
but I'm representing it as assembly within this center image, just because I think that that's an easier way to think about what we're creating from it. You know, we're taking this, this human readable source code and we're simplifying it to um, something that runs on the machine. And really the most accurate is that machine code on the far right, because um, assembly to some degree can be misleading, but we'll, we'll get into that a bit later. Yeah. Um, so after we compile something, typically we have it run through something called a linker where we take uh, externals to what we wrote and we basically add our references to that to this executable so that it can run. So um, this is maybe a poor example, but say in this initial source code on the right or the left, pardon me, we have a printf hello world. Um, we didn't write the function printf. It's, it's already built in. So let's imagine that that was just part of some DLL we were including. Um, we wouldn't want to recreate that DLL and bake it into every single executable we had every single time. Um, we might want to. You know, there's a lot of different ways of skinning a cat, so to speak. But um, it's entirely possible that we would just want to link to it so that we don't have to um, take up more space. Um, so yeah, we're going to go into why it looks like this and how we can reverse it because what we're really doing is we're not we're not like unlinking necessarily and we're not necessarily going back to straight up the exact source code that we had, but we are trying to get an understanding of what's going on. Um, so hex, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is what even is hex. Hex is just a way that we shorten things. You know, it's it's base sixteen. So if we think about a base ten number like a thousand, that's the most easy way of reading, it, right? Um, in binary, it takes up a lot more digits. Like it, it takes way longer for us to express. Hex, not so much. It's it's shorter than both of them. And in my opinion, it's much easier to read as bytes. So we can structure things really simply. You can you can read binary in bytes too quite easily, but um, that that gets that just takes a long time and takes up a lot of visuals. Um, so in this context and what we're looking at, we can think of these as representing opcodes and data. Probably some other things that I didn't think of off the top of my head when I was making this, but um, opcodes, those are instructions. The way I think of opcodes is um, on a circuit, we, or on a CPU, pardon me, we have a bunch of circuits. And each of those circuits does a specific thing. So something like uh, move a value to the EAX register, which I know. that won't uh, make I sense to you door. necessarily I immediately. Close the door. Close the door. I right, close the door. I right, close the door. I right, Lonnie, close the door. I want to close the door. But we'll, uh, we'll get there eventually. I want so We have um, something like um, uh, B805 dash dash dash. You know, that's the machine way of saying, hey, we have this circuit, we're sending it this value, and that's how we're doing it. Um, so then we'll also go into like data representation and stuff like that in a little bit. Uh, so one thing you'll notice is that you can write just a little bit of code, and you might have this, relatively speaking, big-looking binary that's an output that has a bunch of different stuff. Um, and that might seem kind of weird. So, so to be fair, you know, each of those instructions that's pretty human-readable is just a lot of little instructions running on the machine, right? Um, but it's not just code that's in that executable. Um, so every single time that you double-click an exe or whatever and it run, we wind up um, having something loaded by the operating system uh, from storage into memory, and then, you know, trickling into the CPU as well. Um, so that means we have a few different parts of that uh, executable. So we have headers, for instance, which will give some information, you know, hey, is this safe to run? What type of thing is this to run? Um, gen general meta information about the binary. And then we have all these different sections. Uh, so that's how we sort of segment out, you know, hey, we have our code here that runs in this section. We have uh, imported data or read-only data, that kind of thing, in other sections. Um, the way that that makes sense to me is I tend to think of books. Um, books, say you buy a, a novel or something, um, or some sort of textbook, anything like that. You do have the content that you think of as being the book, right? But like, if you just crack open the book, you're probably not going to start on like literal page one on the first sheet of paper you flip over and then just start reading start to finish and have that be like the intended content of the book. Um, so each book has a predictable structure so that we can go find the entry point so we can start reading. Uh, meta information to understand the book and skip around to different sections such as 
chapters is all over there. Uh, we, we might have data like glossaries, indexes, that kind of thing um, external to the book. And that is pretty normal. Um, so let's go ahead and look a little bit more into that. So what we're going to specifically try and look at right now is portable executable files, uh, aka PE files. So if you're running like a, a .exe, that's going to be a PE file. Uh, if you're going to run like a .dll, you know, that's going to be a PE file as well. It's just not executable necessarily uh, easily on its own. Although, you know, you can, you just have to call like a DLL to run that DLL. Um, so they tend to follow this predictable structure. They have an MZ header, which we'll look at in a little bit. Uh, they have this PE header, which uh, has some, some other information. And then they have a, a section table, which tells you about your different sections. Um, there can be a bunch of different types of sections, so I just put down a couple that we'll, we'll take a peek at. And so you can see, like, um, text is usually where your code is. Data is typically where you have this um, writable, initialized data. You might have read-only data, like strings or something like that. You might have uh, import tables, export tables, that kind of thing. And typically you can see, you know, if, if we look at these memory references at the bottom there, um, you can see, like, oh, my sections begin at, you know, this uh, section of memory and they end at this section in memory. And notice too, you know, a, a section like text that starts at, um, you know, hex 401,000 and goes to 401,011. Um, the next one starts at 402,000. So there's always this padding. And then you also have differences in terms of, uh, you know, an executable looks like one thing on, on your hard drive, and it looks like another when it's loaded into memory. Because like I said, there's some information in there about how to even load it. Um, so at this point, I'd like to actually take a step back and look at some, you know, actual binary. And I think that that'll help this make some sense. And uh, don't make fun of me too bad for being on a Mac. Someone show me a nicer laptop, and I'll be happy to switch. Um, so here we see a .exe. You know, we can tell this is a .exe. This is just in a hex editor called O10. Um, I'm a big fan of O10 editor, and one of the reasons I like it is because you can have these templates that show different parts of your binary. So for instance, we have up here the DOS header that starts at the beginning, and it has this little MZ up here that we can see. Um, each of these numbers at the top designates that we're going in one byte. So this is one byte, you know, in here, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, five. And so when the loader tries to load these, it's looking for things in these hyper-specific areas. So like the Windows loader, for instance, if it doesn't see the MZ header, it's, it's not going to want to run this binary. Um, similarly, we can see down here that there's this thing called the DOS stub. And the DOS stub right here says this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Why is that? That's because Windows is really big on backwards compatibility. And so it's got to have this thing in the beginning that tells you, like, hey, you can't actually run this on a DOS machine, but um, kind of similar to how a packet encapsulates things in headers. Um, Windows is looking for these exact things to tell what kind of thing it is. And then we get to, you know, the um, PE header, as I, I think of it, it's load, uh, listed in here as NT header. But um, we, have, we have something called the optional header that is one of my favorite things to take a peek at. And if you see here, we can even see where are these specific bytes listed within this binary. Um, and these are pretty important things to go through and look at. So something like here, where we have the magic byte right here. Uh, pardon me, those can sometimes be referred to, I guess, as magic bytes because it's longer than one. Um, it specifies that it's a PE 32-bit file. Uh, so it was linked with version 14.12. You know, it, this tells us the size of the code. This tells us the size of the data. This tells us where the code starts, um, this address of entry point here. Um, so we can see, you know, the code starts at 1,000 hex. So if we recall, when we were looking at that section table earlier, um, it started at 401,000, right? Uh, and the next one started at 402,000. Um, the reason that is is because the image base here, right here, uh, starts at, what is that, 400,000 hex? And then we have everything going after that. So this is probably going to sound like a, a lot of math and counting at times as we go through this. And it's really not too bad. Um, but what I'm wondering if we can't do is as we go through these sections, see what we even know about this. 
So let's take a look at our section headers in here. We see that we have a section header for .txt. That's where our code is. We can see a section header for our data. That's where our read-only data is. We can see our section header for dot data, which is um, just, uh, I believe, just initialized read-write data. And then we have resources and relocations, neither of which we're really going to go into right now. Um, the structure of a PE file is something that you'll want to go through and take a peek at and learn if you're wanting to get further into this. Um, the more you can learn, the better. And it'll also just happen over time. Um, but I will say it's, it's the sort of thing that you'll just kind of pick up as you go along. And the biggest thing to me in reverse engineering is saying like, hey, OK, I know a little bit. You know, say I know the basic structure of a binary. Um, what can I do with that? You know, it's, it's taking what we, can, what we know and saying, well, how can I get more out of it? Almost like a CTF exercise or any time when you, you start to learn something and you want to learn more about it, but you don't necessarily have an easy way of going about it. Um, so let's go ahead and look at some of our section data. And here we see this code. It's represented in hex. Now it's going to be a pain to go through. But then we see our read-only data. And we start to see something that looks kind of interesting. We see enter password right here. Um, and then we can see it says crack me and either correct or wrong password. So knowing this, that tells us that we know a little bit about binary. And if we were looking at this in IDA, which we will a little bit later, we could go and say, hey, I want to I wanna follow this and see where this is referenced in the code, because the code must be using this data, or it would not be in here. Um, and then we could go ahead and see how things are working. Um, that said, if we were just looking at this for the purposes of analysis or writing a Yara or something like that, we could probably take this string out and say like, hey, crackme.correct exclamation point is probably a pretty unique string. And we could run it on a bunch of samples and maybe write a Yara rule that would identify this file. Um, there may not be anything else that's super interesting to look at through in here, but we can also see, hey, okay, here's, um, Here's some leftover from the person who made this, uh, Ophir, who uh, made a begin.re, which is a really great spot. Um, we can also see here's like our, our data section that looks like it's pretty empty. You know, we can see all these null bytes. And then resources and relocations, frankly, we're not really going to go into right now. But um, I would encourage you to do so on your own. So I would say, you know, I think that what this does is ask you for a password and you enter one and it tells you yes or no. And I do think we could crack it. And everyone else probably feels this. So let's start talking a little bit about assembly. And here's where things get a little bit wonkier, but just kind of stick around for the ride. And I think that will be fine. Um, so like I said, think of opcodes as CPU circuits and, in, you know, instructions as human readable. Um, we might have an instruction like we see down here where I'm explaining the syntax, uh, move EAX 05, and that's where we're moving the constant uh, uh, 05 to the EAX register. Um, one thing to note is that you, as far as I know, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, you are basically an Intel syntax always going to have some kind of register on the left-hand operand because you need to store something every single time you do an operation, or what was the point? Um, so say even you're, you're having a comparison of two values, um, one of those values is going to be in a register generally. And then sometimes you're affecting things that you don't even see in here, which we'll go into that a little bit later too. Um, registers, I would say I think of them as variables in some ways. And this is all 32-bit, by the way. So when you see certain things like EAX, and if you look at a, a a binary later and you see something like RAX, um, that lets you know that you're probably looking at 64-bit assembly because it's, a, it's a, a bigger register. But anyhow, so EAX in itself is even broken down into smaller bits. Like if you wanted to use a, a, just a 16-bit variable, you could use AX. If you wanted to use just an 8-bit variable, you could use A8. Um, and then each of these has their own different um, Different uses, typically, as far as what a, what a compiler assigns them and uses them. But um, if you're handwriting assembly, you can generally kind of do whatever you want, because who's going to stop you? So I would say, too, the way I mentally think of these is uh, EAX through EDX, I think of as storing data that I'm 
uh, messing around with. And then I see uh, ESI through EBP as being indexes and pointers. Um, but let's go on to the next page and we'll talk a little bit more about these. So the EAX register, I think of it as the accumulator register. I'm pretty sure that's the real name. So it's usually when we're doing like um, returning a value, doing some math, something like that, you know, you might have something in EAX. Um, EBX, frankly, most of the time, if I'm using it, I use it for uh, the same thing as EAX. But uh, you'll often see that EBX is holding function parameters, uh, indexed addresses, that kind of thing. Um, say you're writing something with a loop, you'll typically see that into uh, that loop counting in ECX. Um, and then EDX, I kind of think of that as, again, like EBX, I tend to think of it as just a register that I, I use for something. Um, in terms of indexes, we might be using those to store content and constants. We might be using them to store pointers. Uh, we might be using them just to hold a pointer to like a, an area that we want to go to. And a pointer, think of that as being a reference to a specific place. Um, which fortunately I wrote that down here. The, the biggest pointers to get a hold of right now are ESP and EBP. And we'll go into some specific examples, which will help this make a lot more sense, I promise. Um, and then familiarity, as always, is just way better the more that you listen to these kinds of things or, or go and look at um, look at your own files, you know, go and do all sorts of things. Um, so we should also not forget flags. Flags become a thing that I don't feel like you'll often see or talk about, but they're pretty important. So if we're doing something like comparing two different values, um, this is a good example where we're saying, OK, there's a 0 flag that we change to 1 if these are not equal. If they are equal, then it's just set to 0. Um, and then if the 0 flag is set to 1, we're going to jump to this other location. Think of that as basically in pseudocode something along the lines of like, hey, you know, if this, then this. If not, then that. And uh, it would jump us around to different functions. Um, or just locations, and then we would continue moving on based on that. So I have in here the zero flag, like I mentioned, uh, the sign flag. So think of that as being like, hey, you know, is this like a, a straight up negative one, or is this a one? And we might have a flag that we use to uh, keep track of that. Uh, and then the overflow uh, flag, which is pretty important and will be used at the end of this presentation. Um, where we're going to look at that to see if a result was larger than the register can hold. So say, say we basically overflow a register. You know, we, we hit something that holds 8 bits with a 9-bit character. Um, we're going to overflow that 8-bit register, and that will likely trigger the overflow uh, flag. So let's get into calling stacks now. This is where it all starts kind of coming together, and I feel like these did not make very much sense to me for a long time. That's OK. It's not too complicated. Don't overthink it. It's just, um, it just comes to you with. So what is a stack? Think of a deck of cards. Uh, if you're pulling from the deck of cards, the stack of cards, if you will, you're probably pulling from the top card. Um, you might uh, get this confused potentially with a heap where you're pulling from the bottom generally, like first in, first out. But this is last in, first out. So top of the stack, we pop it off. Um, this allows us to pass variables, call a function with them, and return to our previous function. So um, if anyone recalls that little game where you have the three pegs, and then you have uh, larger and smaller concentric circles on top of those pegs, try to get them all from one side to the other, that's kind of how the stack works. So in order to do that, we push variables onto the stack in reverse order. And then um, th this is when we're doing like a fu function call, by the way. So we'll be pushing functions onto there. Like say we have two variables. We would push variable two onto there, and then we would push a variable, or yeah, we'd push variable one onto there, and then uh, we push EBP onto there. EBP is going to be our base pointer. Um, this is going to be illustrated on the next slide, so if this still seems super confusing, just hang with. Um, so EBP is put on there so that we basically know where our function is really starting. And then it is the assign the value that is the top of the stack. And so these values I'm referring to, by the way, are memory locations on the stack for all intents and purposes. 
And some of this is going to be a little bit wonky as we go through it, but it's, um, it's a little simplified at the expense of accuracy at times, just so it's understood. Um, ESP is always going to go to the top of the stack, uh, change as needed. And we're going to see that EBP is popped from the stack when we go into these illustrations and return to that previous ESP value. And that's how we return to the function that called the function. So that was all probably really confusing. So let's go ahead and do this visually. Um, so in simple terms, we save where we came from with the EBP. And then we can use the saved ESP value that we saved to EBP to return us to the function that called us. So we're going to go through this with an example using uh, the code that I have over here uh, on the right. Um, keep in mind, we're trying to emulate compiler behavior to some degree, but um, this isn't necessarily just like what compiler output is going to look like. Um, so I wouldn't expect if you're using GCC or something like that and compiling stuff like this to, to mirror exactly what I'm doing. Um, but the good thing is, as we go through this, we're going to see that reading assembly is a lot easier than writing. Um, oh yeah, and let's, let's quickly talk about what's going on over here, actually. So let's, uh, let's look at this. We see that we have, you know, two different functions, right? We have a subtract function where we take, uh, interrupt, uh, pardon me, uh, integer C, and then C equals, you know, integer A minus integer B. And then we return integer C. And that is called from main, where we assign the values to A and B, we subtract them uh, using that subtract method, and then we return. So we have this in a pseudo assembly, if you will, right? Um, so we're going to notice, by the way, a pattern. Every single time when you're reversing something in x86, like you're going to see these functions begin with push EBP, move EBP, uh, ESP. So we're pushing EBP onto the stack, and then we're moving the value from ESP into EBP. Um, on the right, I just have a pretend call stack, and our memory will grow down in first order, just like our variables are added on. So if we look at the sort of pseudo assembly down here, um, here's our function call beginning. Um, we have the variables that are being pushed on in reverse order, and then we have our uh, our subtract function call. So here we have our variables, we have our function call. So then the immediate next thing that happens is we're pushing EBP, we're moving uh, ESP to EBP. So currently we see ESP is at the top of the stack, and then we see our variables in here, just like how we did, and we have a return address here, and now we have EBP right here. So now that our local variables are accounted for on the stack, you're going to notice that it continues to grow down. Uh, and by the way, some people illustrate this different. I've seen a lot of people um, like to go in reverse order. I just think this is personally kind of easier to read, so this is how I like to do it. But um, I, I would make sure that if you're interested in this, you kind of go through and uh, take a bit of a, a look at um, how different people explain it. Because uh, some people are better than others, and a lot of those people are probably better than but so where we left off at was we'd pushed EBP and we've moved uh, ESP to EBP, right? So here we're just pushing onto the stack and adding variables for A and B to, to hold that space. And then we're loading that value into uh, those, vari those variables, so to speak. So the reason we have these in this, uh, this brackets is we're taking, we're saying, hey, you know, we know that, um, we know that these sizes of memory that we, we looked at were this given distance, and we're just passing a reference, like a literal memory reference pointer into EDX. EDX. So we're not actually passing the values 5 and 10 into EDX and ECX. We're saying, hey, here's where those values are. And so those get pointed to. And every single time that we push and pop things off the stack, we are moving ESP because part of what push and pop instructions do is move ESP accordingly. And that's really helpful because that's something that um, if you were writing assembly, you just you wouldn't have to do uh, on your own. And then we can see too, we're, we're moving some space down, subtracting four from ESP. And that gives us an extra four bytes that we can hold our NC for returning. So now we can actually perform that 
notice that we aren't, um, like I mentioned, <laughs> moving ESP around on our own. We're not, we're not saying, hey, move ESP, um, ESP plus OX4. ESP is just going every single time, push and pop things off the stack. Very, very helpful. So here we could say um, subtract uh, 4 from ESP. That's moving ESP. Then we could say subtract EDX from ECX. And then um, that stores the value in ECX. So in, in assembly, we have, uh, we have our destination operand, like I mentioned. That's where the, the end value of that is always stored. So if we said return EDX ECX, for example, then the return value would, or the, the value of the output of that would be. Um, and then we can even do something along the lines of like, hey, move the ECX value to the NC location. And so then we're just loading that ECX value from our previous instruction and we're storing it. And then we're moving uh, that to EAX for the return. And EAX isn't on the stack, but it doesn't have to be. Um, those registers just exist on the chip as physical. And one of the reasons this might look weird and mechanical to you is because we're not, we're still dealing with software, I guess, but once you get this low level and you're basically just writing instructions that run directly on the chip, um, in some ways it feels more mechanically to me mentally. And that's kind of why I like the example of um, that three pronged game where you're removing the concentric around. So then here is where we're going to clean up our stack and we would return with our value C. So here we would, uh, we would be removing C by just adding 4 to ESP. So that lets us just shoot right up. And then we can pop ECX, that takes it off the stack. We can pop EDX off the stack and those move ESP as well. And um, then we can pop EDP, EBP and popping EBP uh, will allow us to return. And so return, one of the things it does is it returns to the address that ESP is now pointing to, which should be main. Okay, so we've looked at that, and that probably seems a little bit confusing. So now let's look at some actual assembly for the last file that we looked at. And I'm going to look at this in IDA. So in here, this is where this function begin. You know, we can see, hey, enter password. We can see then um, that it pushes a value called crack me, right? And we can see that it uh, also has this, whatever this is here. Um, so then each of these also goes and calls different subroutines. So we could, um, we could go further into looking in what those individual subroutines do, but let's not worry too much about that. One thing that we'll see is that as we go down here and we push the uh, values into EAX, we see that it's comparing uh, EAX with EAX, and depending on how that comparison goes, it jumps to another value. Um, so compare EAX, EAX, I suppose, should always be equal. But what we see here is, um, you know, we have two different branching options, potentially. We have something called correct, and we have something called wrong password. Um, what this says to me is if this was a simple reversing challenge, we would probably just be taking crack me and trying that out and seeing if that works, and it would work. Um, that would function for this. So this is a really kind of simplified way of looking at this. And it's a good way of knowing, too, like, hey, it's important to understand how the stack mechanics work, but we don't need to look at this and understand every single structure. Um, the other thing that I think is important to understand here is, okay, so we have push, sub, move, um, zor, load executable address, call, test, jump not zero, and return. And I think those are all of the, in, the different instructions used in here. Um, that's only like nine instructions. So realistically, like you don't actually need to memorize a whole bunch of assembly instructions to get started and re and start poking out because really like most of these are, are moves pushes pops um add and subtract you know it's it's pretty simple at this level to uh at times kind of a frustrating level um so really this is not something that you necessarily need to know 
a crazy amount of assembly or low-level computing in order to really get started in. You basically just have to find things you're interested in, understand where you want to go poke around. So if we think about things like, um, you know, strings, for instance, uh, we should be able to pop those up here. That's going to be, especially for malware analysis, a lot of times, like, the first thing that you're freaking looking at is strings. Like, you can, you can write Yara just looking at strings. And I'm not saying that that's not the easiest um, thing for, like, a malicious actor to go ahead and change. But at the same time, there's a lot of times, especially something like ransomware, they probably got a note in there. And you can literally use that string and write a detection for it pretty easy. Um, do note, though, that a lot of times you can also have something, like, if, you, uh, if you're more familiar with programming and you recall, like, arrays, um, arrays, for example, won't necessarily just show up as a um, read-only string because arrays are something that you can, you know, functionally go and mess around with, right? Like it actually is like readable, writable data typically, and it shows up um, in a different section, it's like raw data to my. So those I tend to find in a debugger if I'm pulling them up. Um, but we could also go into hex view here. You know, we could take a look around here. We don't see necessarily like we did before, um, you know, looking at the instructions, like straight up assembly. But we do know that this, this uh, becomes assembly instructions. Um, the other thing that I think is pretty interesting to look for is imports and exports. So you're not often going to see very many exports. Um, if you do, that means that you're probably looking at a DLL because they're made to basically be exported functions. Um, however, if you're just looking at your imports here, um, you can see, like, okay, this is using the kernel 32 library. We can see this is using VC runtime 140. Um, we can see these various uh, others under here. I've, I've had a few samples before that I've looked at at work and felt um, completely, completely stuck on. And it was just incredibly frustrating. Didn't know what to do with myself. Um, you know, it's, it's so frustrating when you, you work on something and you just feel like you can't get out of it, right? Um, at that point before, I know I've, I've definitely just started looking through the imports and like jotted down any that seemed interesting to me. When I was first starting, I was literally writing down every single import and looking up what they did. Um, sometimes you won't necessarily have nice names like these. You know, we won't really go into symbols because of time constraints, but um, there's, there's certain references that are, you know, something like um, if you write your own function and you name it main, for instance, that, that may not just show up in a binary. Usually that kind of information is, like, frankly, scrubbed out of there because it's not really necessary for a computer to run it. So having um, extended names is just kind of a waste of space. But um, you, you might so you, you might literally look at a lot of these, and uh, if you're looking at a, a sample that's really tough for you, you, you might just be going through and saying, okay, what do I know a little bit about? Like, where can I get a little bit of information out? And then where can I go and pivot from that? Um, I've had samples before that I was trying to uh, get to run, for instance, and I could tell like is debugger present was there, and that literally like sets this. It sets some register to one. I can't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head, but the only way I could get the sample to run was by writing a little Python thing to uh, reset that register every single time that is debugger present showed up. Um, so there's there's always something to get out of. It. And then I'm going to take a second, too, and see if I'm missing a question. Oh, and uh, how to find these afterwards. If you're looking for the binaries, for example, you can scroll up. And I did, I did put them up there. But like, I would recommend, I guess, going and finding your own, only because, like, um, I don't know. I wouldn't download binaries from some random DEF CON speaker. <laughs> but enough people know me to know that I'm not like a a giant clown and uh, that I, I like my job and I don't want to get fired for something like uh, just passing people malware doing a, doing a talk. Um, but let's go ahead and pop back into the present. So here we're going to do something probably a little bit more fun and a little bit less abstract. And we're going to do something called a ROP chain. And ROP chain stands for uh, Return Oriented Programming. And basically what we're going to do at a high level is we're going to overflow a buffer and then we are going to um, basically use that to look at a little bit of stack, stack mechanics, see like, hey, um, how can we exploit a program? So what we have here is a, a ret to win binary. 
these are typically something where it's literally standing for return to win. Like you have some kind of value, like a flag or something that you want to spit out um, from some sort of inaccessible function or some otherwise weird thing. And we're going to try to exploit the program ourselves in order to return the flag. Um, so I did some in initial recon on this, uh, again, partially because we're going to have some time constraint. And I found some function names that were named main, pwn me, and return to win, which is where I think our flag is. Um, so in order to do this, I'm going to go into screenshots because, again, I'm on a Mac. Uh, in my defense, I just moved and I don't have anything set up yet. So we're going to have to look at screenshots of me doing this versus me doing this in one silicon because I think I'm going to have to set up a freaking AWS image or something with some, something so I can do uh, x86 stuff on it. But uh, the other thing is notice that this uh, up here says it's an ELF32 file. We don't see anything about P. Um, that's because this is a Linux executable. So it has a different structure from PE files, although a lot of the fundamentals carry over. Like, for instance, if you're looking for, like, the code section of an ELF file, you're going to look in .txt. It's the same thing. Um, if you're looking for data, you know, you might have some things that are named a little different. You know, the structure of it's going to be different, like I said. It gets loaded into the operating system different. But um, we're, we're going to see all these different uh, uh, things. But really what we're looking at is going to be just looking at the code itself. It's going to look about the same. Um, another thing that we should talk about really briefly is Indian. And Indianness can be kind of confusing, I guess, in abstract, but it's saying, hey, where's the least significant bit? Is it on the far left or the far right? So if it's, if it's at the end, then it's little Indian. If it's at the beginning, then it's big Indian. Or maybe I got that backwards. I'll, I'll have to look that up. Uh, and if someone wants to correct me in the chat, that's not ruin my life. Um, as well as if anyone ever wants to correct me about anything in the chat, that's, that's definitely my life. Um, but the way I think of it, for example, is like if we say the number 31, um, the number 3 is the biggest number in that, right? It refers to 310. Um, the number 1 refers to 1-1, one, one, and so that's the smallest number in it for it's at the end. Um, so let's go ahead and look at actually what we're doing here. Um, so here's the main method, and I just disassembled it in uh, GDB, which is GNU debugger. Um, and then I like to install a Pwn debugger on top of it because GDB native is really confusing to me, frankly, and probably a lot of other people. Um, I know some people like to use uh, GEF, uh, G -E -F. so John, for instance, in here. Um, he's like underscore, underscore, John, underscore, underscore. He's a, he's a big GEF guy. Um, but here, what we see at a high level is we see that we have um, a call to pwn me down at line, it looks like a plus 69, very nice. Uh, what, a, what a happy circumstance. So we know, at, at a high level, what we know about this is that this is a function which does some BS, and eventually it calls a function called pwn. So let's go look at pwn. Um, what do we see here? Again, probably not much. You know, we do see at the very top, push EBP, move EBP, ESP, you know, right? So we know it's starting a function. Um, and then we'll see certain things like, you know, it's pushing EAX and then calling uh, memset at PLT or whatever. Um, so we can see, okay, it's, it's pushing variables and then calling things. That seems very familiar to us, right? We can see it's adding and subtracting ESP. Um, we've seen that before. So we know that might be um, making space and taking away space for variables on the stack. We see it pushing things. Um, and again, here too, let's, let's notice um, push, move, subtract, load executable address, call. Um, at the very end, there's a return, and I guess there's like a NOP, which means no operation. So that's, that's like seven different instructions. So like what, what looks like gibberish, frankly, like the, the more that you kind of stare at these things, just gets a lot easier to deal with. So that said, let's look at our final function. Oh, and another thing, we can see this doesn't call to return to win, right? So if we, if we hypothetically pretended that we weren't doing like a crash course right now, and we hadn't looked at it, we'd be wondering like, well, okay, well, what the heck calls turn to win? Um, and then for this intents and purposes, we'll just know like, hey, it's an island function. It doesn't actually have any reference. Um, I'm not even sure if it's like really easy to compile something like that. Uh, so that might be a fun project if someone wants to go and just um, start making, I guess, bad compilers that keep things 
that are unreferenced, completely unused. Um, that would be a nice, uh, nice thing. Just don't push it to anything anybody uses. But so here we have our ret to win function. And um, this, like I said, appears to be an island. We haven't looked at the entire binary in depth, but we do see like, okay, it calls a few things and then it returns. I don't even know what it would return to because I don't know that it's called by anything. So this is the GDB uh, pwn, pwn debugger interface. Um, so at the top, we can see that we have our registers and we can see what's in those registers. Um, we can see the disassembly sort of in the middle there. And at the bottom, we can see the stack. And then the backtrace, we won't even worry about the backtrace. Those, those are the three things we want to see. So what you need to know is like, hey, I, I ran this program in a debugger and I set a breakpoint for the, the, the main function where I wanted it to stop. And then I set a breakpoint for uh, pwn me. And then I set a breakpoint for return to win. Um, and if we really just ran through this, we wouldn't even hit return to win because like I said, there's no actual reference to it. Um, so we can even say, see, for instance, in uh, EAX, um, we can see shell uh, bin bash referenced because that's where I launched it from. Um, you know, we can see that the registers are mostly, you know, kind of unused, but we can see, um, you know, EIP is about to have this operation. Um, so anyhow, if we just continued running, what would happen is that it would go ahead and it would run until it hits pwn me and our second breakpoint triggers. Um, so in pwn me, again, we really don't see anything that interesting, but what pwn me does is it pops up this little message. And we can also see, you know, some of our registers are being used. EAX is now holding five. Um, we can see um, whatever eight Fs in a row uh, comes out to is up there. Um, then we can see um, EDI, ESI, and we can see uh, EIP uh, is at pwn me plus six. And we can see our stack two down here, which um, we don't really see anything that interesting in here. So, so we'll go ahead and keep running it. And so here it starts to prompt us for some input. Um, I don't really know how to count to 56 bytes off the top of my head. Um, I can only count to my IQ, and it's less than that. So I just go ahead and uh, we, we continue until it asks. And then we're going to feed it some bullshit input. Um, so it says here, for my first trick, I will attempt to fit 56 bytes of user input into 32 bytes of stack buffer. What could possibly go wrong? Great question. Um, so we gave it some input. And this input that you see is a weird look, looking uh, pattern, right? We have four A's in a row, then a B in three A's, C in three A's, D in three A's. Um, why that is, is going to be pretty visible on the next slide. But it's because we want to know, like, hey, um, when, when this goes in there, we want to see where these things land. So we, we crashed it. We, we overflowed the stack. Um, so we can see, you know, we have uh, ka, ma, na, la up there, you know, EBP, ESP, EIP. And then we can see, um, you know, we can see ESP referenced in the stack there. And let's talk about why it broke. Um, part of that is because EIP now goes to something called 6161616166C. And this is problematic because EIP is our instruction pointer. So it tells, it tells us where the next instruction is coming from. And if there's no instruction for it to go to at 6161616166C, then it's just going to crash because it's, it's broken. We can't go to a thing that's not there. Um, if anyone can kind of uh, tell here, the thing that makes this interesting is that means that we can control the instruction pointer. So if we can control the instruction pointer, we can control where it goes to. And if we can control where it goes to, then we no longer have an issue with going to that return to win function. Um, so we're going to create our exploit. So now that we've overflowed, oh, and here, uh, yeah, I'm using Python 2 and uh, sue me. I don't care. So. Uh, we see that we've overflowed and we want to control EIP, our instruction this controls where we're jumping to. So uh, remembering elf is little Indian. Um, so I'm counting the offset to that LAAA, and I'm going to go back and show you why. Um, we can see here that um, that's where the values ar arrived in EIP. So that's what we want to, uh, that's where we want to start putting our code to 
basically jump to the address of our choice. Um, the other thing we can see down here is we see this, uh, this hex, right? We can see that the Python is printing out um, 44 A's in a row, because that's where, again, we get to where we want to put our, uh, our address here. And then it's saying uh, hex 2C, hex 86, hex 04, hex 08, right? Where are those coming from? So let's go back to pwn me. Uh, excuse me, uh, ret to win. Uh, if you look here at the top value, we can see it's 080486 2C, which is the reverse of what we were doing, because remember, it's 2C860408. And why is that in our uh, shell code? That's because it's little Indian, like I mentioned. So we have to do it back. Um, so to go back here, and there we go. And show that again, we can see, you know, hex 2C, hex 86, hex 04, hex 08. And when it prints this out, it does a bunch of A's in a row, like we're screaming into the computer and making it do what we want to do. And then we have this kind of broken character. Um, why am I using Python 2, you might ask? Because it's the least annoying way to print directly to bytes that I can go spit into an exploit and put into a program. Um, I'm not that freaking clever, so like, I think it's kind of annoying when I have to go in Python 3 and do it a different way, because Python 3 doesn't print native to bytes. I think it prints as Unicode. And if you want some adventures in hex editing, try, uh, try printing out some, some random stuff in Python 2 and try printing out some random stuff in Python 3 and go and compare it. And you'll see, oh, cool, like um, this, this actually functionally looks different in a hex editor because it, it's like flagged as Unicode. Anyhow, so now we're going to go ahead and try to get that to run. And I'm just doing that by starting that ret to win 32 binary uh, and inputting the payload. And so then we aren't actually doing this in the debugger, but it does spit out that we did it properly. So we can see that we got our flag, which is a rope, a placeholder 32 bit uh, byte flag. And because we didn't give it like a, a proper way to go back to, um, it's going to return to some reference that's utterly broken because we didn't fix it in our. Uh, Drop chain, um, it's basically just going to crash. But that's okay. We already got our flag. Um, that is the main amount of what I wanted to go through. But stick around. I, I'm happy to answer questions and stuff like that. Um, some Twitter folks. I, I put myself at the top just because I have like a weird Twitter name and I didn't feel like reading it out. But it's it's hex for Marco. Um, some people who are actually worth following are below me, and they're all fantastic. Um, some of them are associated with uh, temp out. Um, I know Malware Unicorn and uh, Ophir Harpaz are, are how I kind of got started on this stuff um, when I was trying to kind of go for like um, from low level, you know, script kitty to at least average script kitty. Um, binary golf is one of my absolute favorites to go take a peek at. It's basically people taking these parts of the binaries. Um, let's go look at you know our hex editor again. It's going in and saying, hey, which parts of these are actually it probably wouldn't run, right? But there's definitely parts of binaries that you can, you can just like remove or completely mangle and they'll still run. Um, you know, there's certain things like you can just go and, and like literally rewrite the names of these sections and overwrite it with random bytes and the program will still run. Um, there may be things down here that you just don't even need to have in there. And so the binary golf folks uh, tend to have these pretty interesting competitions where they try to reduce the file sizes uh, as much as possible in order to um, basically just come up with a, a weird, teeny tiny executable. Um, NetSpooky on there organizes it, and I would highly recommend following him. Um, he is one of the uh, people who really got me interested in doing Re as more than like a little, little hobby. Um, that was, I think, where I started to see kind of the implications and in getting interested in low-level computing. Um, Birch Boy is a good homie from Twitter. Uh, he does a lot of malware analysis and writes about it. Um, Rich and Ryan down there are both brilliant folks, especially Ryan. He has written one of the best books I've read on reversing um, learning Linux binary analysis, which I shout out over there. Um, on the next slide, I'll show you uh, some, some art from my blog, but I, I got that from Little Bit Space, who is absolutely fantastic and has really helped me with um, some um, on my articles that I tend to blog about, 
I tend to do most of the ASCII, but certain things I'm like, hey, I need someone who can make something actually look awesome. And uh, they're, they're just so freaking cool. So I would definitely check out their art. Um, websites, begin.re really is a, a huge inspiration for what I'm even doing here. Um, I would highly recommend going and looking at that. Openanalysis.net is great because they, they basically do a lot of tutorials. I think there's a Patreon. Um, in terms of finding samples, if you want to actually poke at malware, I'd recommend VX Underground. I will say if you download any of their, uh, any of their samples, they're going to come in a password-protected zip file. So you will have to message them just to get uh, access. I would, just, I would just DM them on Twitter and ask for the password. And then uh, the temp out zine is amazing. I've seen so much cool stuff over there. Um, in terms of books, the big one I'd like to highlight, POC or GTFO, is just like crazy engineering, especially reverse engineering. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. But if I had to have only one book on this list for work upskilling, I would probably buy Practical Malware Analysis, because I would assume most people here are interested for um, the purposes of getting into malware analysis. Um, Windows internals I found pretty helpful because I don't really like Windows that much. Uh, I had to pick up a bit because I normally kind of daily drive uh, Linux on my, my main machine. And Linkers and Loaders is helpful because it's literally, as far as I know, the only book on link loading. And uh, this is made by Little Bit Space, so just to, to cap it off with that. But anyhow, thank you guys so much for listening. Happy to answer any questions. And um, Sincerely appreciate it. And also, if people have um, suggestions on how to improve this or whatever, like I, I absolutely won't be offended. I would love to continue improving this presentation uh, and uh, continue to give it and, and try to help people get kind of a launching spot into, um, into reversing and just poking around at things, really just feeling comfortable to uh, continue exploring and asking questions.